because uh, as the modern phenomena is, you look at the picture from upstairs and everybody's holding a camera. Uh, so please don't stream. I'm Askia Muhammad. I'm a news director at WPFW-FM. That's the Pacifica station here in Washington. I write a column for the Washington Informer newspaper here, and I'm a senior editor at the Final Call newspaper. I'd like to, as I introduce this distinguished panel, remind you of the one of the things I considered so important about this event. The event has collected what I would say are unimpeachable witnesses uh, to something that is an unspoken reality, an unspoken truth. And so just bear that in mind. The witnesses are unimpeachable. There are a couple of things I'd like to commend to your attention. Yesterday, April the 9th, was the 150th anniversary of the uh, surrender of the treasonous rebel leader, General Robert E. Lee, the, the Army of the Northern Virginia surrendered unconditionally to the United States Army led by Ulysses Grant. I say treasonous and traitorous because it was 110 years after General Lee's death before his citizenship in the United States of America, the US of A, was restored. They were in rebellion. They were uh, formed a armed uprising against the United States of America, which I think constitutes treason and traitor behavior. <clears throat> I mention that because at that, after this surrender unconditionally, it ushered in 100 years of American apartheid, um, which ended ostensibly with the passage of the Civil Rights Acts and the 1960s Civil Rights Movement. I use the word apartheid because a clone, and it was just referred to of the United States of America, uh, the US of A, uh, the U of SA, uh, South Africa, really perfected the apartheid uh, regime and uh, brought it into existence. And it seemed even up until the presidency of Ronald Reagan that it might endure forever. But as uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. reminds us, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. South African apartheid was dismantled. Today, President, former President Jimmy Carter says what no president, no sitting president can ever say, uh, and has, will say, uh, in the cover of his book, the title of his new book, uh, Palestine, Peace, Not Apartheid. And when this question is raised, why are you calling this apartheid? Well, in some ways it is an apartheid state, although the population is 50-50, and if there were a one-state solution, boy, uh, one person, one vote, uh, you'd have a questionable outcome. Nevertheless, the arc of the moral universe is long. It bends toward justice. This event today is a witness of that because I think I heard uh, uh, Grant Smith say this a similar event was organized a few months ago, and about one-fourth the participants were here. And so this is growing. The BDS movement is growing. and so. Uh, prepare to understand that um, you are not alone. <clears throat> the uh, guests I'm going to introduce, and I guess we'll have them speak in alphabetical order again, unimpeachable. Please allow me to uh, present for his remarks uh, Richard Anderson Falk. He is a professor emeritus. of international law at Princeton University, ah, which reminds me of the final quote I'd like to share with you on April the 9th. And uh, it, April the 9th is the, which again reminds us of the, 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 the veracity and the, and the, the eventual um, success of this event uh, or of this cause, this movement. On April 9th in 1898, Paul Robeson, world citizen, was born in Princeton University, where Professor Falk was a, is an emeritus professor. Uh, his, he made a statement which uh, certainly speaks to this event. Quote, the answer to injustice is not to silence the critic, but to end 
the injustice. In the words of Paul Robeson. <clears throat> professor Falk is a, a professor emeritus. He's the author and co-author of 20 books and the co-editor of the 20 volumes, including Achieving Human Rights, Israel, Palestine, on record. Uh, he is also a served for uh, several years from 2008 to 2014 as the UN Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights in the Palestinian territories occupied since 1967. Please welcome our first unimpeachable witness. Alarming, but uh, let me first say that I'm uh, honored and happy to be part of this important event and thank the conveners for bringing us together. It's, it's, it reveals the two sides of the present uh, reality that should be both encouraging and disturbing. The one side being that there are growing voices that seek justice and peace for both peoples. And this kind of gathering, I think, is an affirmation of that. But it's also true, as Jeff Blankford reminded us, uh, that there's a dreadful asymmetry in the way in which the public is informed about these realities. The media uh, indulges in a kind of feasting whenever they get the opportunity to celebrate uh, pro-Israeli uh, happenings, and they practice the opposite in relation to any kind of balanced inquiry into the realities of the conflict. And we must keep both of those realities in mind if we are to understand the situation correctly. Uh, there are no better texts for assessing the damage done to the role and reputation of the United Nations by the Israeli lobby then Secretary of State John Kerry's recent statements about efforts within the UN by the US to protect Israel from the fulfillment of its responsibilities under international law and in relation to the UN. Uh, despite the recent tensions arising over the Netanyahu speech to Congress, Kerry boasted almost at the same time on ABC News, quote, we have intervened on Israel's behalf a couple of hundred times in over 75 different fora within the UN. And when addressing the Human Rights Council in Geneva, Kerry included a statement that could have been drafted by APEC or Israel's ambassador at the UN when he said, it, it must be said that the Human Rights Council's obsession with Israel actually risks undermining the credibility of the entire organization. And further, we will oppose any effort by any group or participant in the UN system to arbitrarily and re regularly delegitimize or isolate Israel not just in the Human Rights Council, but wherever it occurs. What is striking about such statements by our highest ranking government officials dealing with foreign policy is the disconnect between, these unconditional, uh, the, between this unconditional support and Israel's record of disregard for its obligations under international law and with respect to the authority of the United Nations. When speaking uh, 
in, at the March APAC uh, meetings, uh, Representative Lindsey Graham went even further when he told the audience uh, that when, he, when serving as chair of the Senate Appropriations Committee, I'm going to put the UN on notice that I will go after the UN funding if the organization takes any steps to marginalize Israel. During my six years as UN Special Rapporteur for Occupied Palestine, I had the opportunity to observe the manner in which international and national so-called NGOs give pri priority uh, to discrediting those uh, who offer any critical assessment of Israel's conduct. And it's uh, these are so-called uh, NGOs because they're so closely aligned uh, with the governmental priorities and viewpoints of Israel that they should be really known as quasi-governmental organizations. And I think of UN Watch and others in that uh, category. There are really two ways that this effort to uh, devalue and discredit uh, the UN and its uh, activities takes place. One is to attack individuals, and the other is to attack the organization itself. Uh, most uh, consistent, consistently, a reliance on defamatory attacks on the critics as biased and even anti-Semitic whenever someone describing Israeli violations of international uh, uh, law or sympathetically reporting on uh, Palestinian grievances. Coupled with this kind of personal attack is an avoidance of substantive aspects as to whether the criticisms or grievances are well-founded from the perspective of international law and human rights law. In other words, these, at these defamatory attacks are disassociated from whether their substance is grounded in fact and reasonable interpretations of uh, relevant law. <clears throat> Even those uh, defamatory attacks, at least in my case, focused on distorted presentations of my views on a variety of issues that were made in settings other than the UN and did not pertain to the Israeli-Palestine uh, conflict. The intended, the intended effect was to shift attention from the messenger uh, containing uh, these uh, issues uh, to the uh, message itself. In other words, uh, instead of uh, focusing on the message, the hope was to generate a controversy about a disreputable messenger. With incredible persistence, UN Watch in particular, circulated their defamatory attacks to prominent international personalities, including high-ranking civil servants in the UN itself, uh, such as the UN Secretary General and the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and a variety of ambassadors uh, of countries friendly to Israel. What was particularly disturbing uh, to me was the extent to which these defamatory attacks were treated without examination as credible by supposedly responsible officials here in Washington and New York who didn't even bother to check with me or with the sources that were being relied upon and led uh, to the endorsement of such uh, defamation in ways damaging to my reputation, but more significantly, diverting attention uh, from 
the substance of Israeli uncontestable violations of fundamental international law and human rights law. And that's the, it's what I call the politics of deflection. Instead of talking about the real issues that should be discussed within the UN, the effort is to get people to talk about whether a particular person is an anti-Semite or is uh, in some way uh, biased. And it's, it doesn't rest on any facts, it rests on the repetition of the defamation. And if you repeat, as Joseph Goebbels understood very well, if you repeat a lie often enough, it becomes a kind of publicly accepted truth. And, and that's where the, uh, I think, uh, very destructive effect of this kind of tactics occurred. Mentioning just one incident uh, that is illustrative of a much broader pattern, the UN Secretary General uh, Ban Ki-moon uh, denounced me as uh, biased, even using the word as despicable, uh, with reference to opinions that had nothing to do with my role as special rapporteur but referred to uh, distortions of what I had said about 9-11 uh, uh, attacks and about the uh, 2013 uh, Boston Marathon bombing. After the first of these t attacks, I tried to find out uh, why a, uh, the Secretary General would launch such an attack uh, on someone within the organization uh, and I was told by his uh, aide-de-camp that they didn't, as he put it, do due diligence, which means they didn't read uh, what it was, what I supposedly said. And uh, besides, they were under pressure from the U.S. Congress to show that they were not anti-Israeli. And it was at a time when Ban Ki-moon was running for a second term as Secretary General. So one sees the insidious way in which these uh, political maneuvers uh, play out, and it's sort of reminiscent of the Soviet system where the leadership reaches out to some lowly individual like myself in order to uh, demonstrate a kind of larger uh, political reality. Uh, What I'm trying to explain by these references to my experience is the degree to which uh, these uh, quasi-NGOs stir up trouble uh, for those seeking to document allegations concerning Israel's violation and actually weaken uh, the way in which uh, the organization can function on behalf of the international community and the, uh, promoting uh, what I think uh, one would hope would be the global interests rather than merely succumbing to the national interests of the most powerful uh, members of the organization. And uh, one of the uh, uh, most disturbing uh, features of this is the degree to which the U.S. Um, ambassadors at the U.N. swallow what uh, U.N. Watch and uh, uh, NGO Monitor, both uh, kind of quasi-governmental organizations, what they uh, feed them. And uh, again, in my case, uh, Susan Rice and Samantha Power uh, both of whom uh, know better, uh, just routinely repeated the kind of uh, denunciations and defamations that, I, that were associated uh, with these attacks. Uh, the uh, second approach used uh, on behalf of Israel to weaken and discredit the UN involves uh, trying to both manipulate the organization 
and to undermine it at the same time. It, it's a very uh, sophisticated kind of uh, relationship to the UN uh, that Israel has. It, it both pretends to be victimized by the organization, and yet it, because of its uh, relationship to the US and its uh, clever uh, use of these kind of tactics, it intimidates the organization more than any other government, however large or small. It's a kind of a tour de force of a negative variety that it is able, despite being so uncooperative, uh, to be able to uh, impose its views. And the UN is, not, rather than being biased, it leans over backward in every particular context to make sure that uh, Israel's uh, best arguments are made uh, fully available and given uh, as much attention as possible. In other words, the reality is just the opposite of the uh, perception in this country. If anything, the organization could be criticized as being uh, 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 indifferent to the Palestinian uh, reality and uh, bias toward not offending Israel. It's, it's quite uh, an amazing uh, manipulation of uh, the reality, at least as uh, I experienced and understood it. Uh, and uh, there was a recent speech by the Israeli ambassador, uh, Ron uh, Prosser, uh, that uh, spoke of the U that the tide of hatred aimed at Israel within the UN. Uh, and uh, that kind of uh, language uh, is used to influence the atmosphere here in Washington and the Congress. And it's a sad commentary on the state of our democracy uh, that so many of our elected representatives swallow this central lie about the UN, an organization the world desperately needs to be strong and effective, uh, because of these kind of uh, defamatory uh, tactics. Uh, reflecting, uh, rather than the UN reflecting the supposed hostility of oppressive regimes to Israel, the UN has increasingly uh, been neutralized in any effort to produce a sustainable uh, peace uh, that is just for both peoples. One forgets that it is the UN that failed the Palestinian people uh, when the British uh, gave up their colonial mandate and dumped the future of Palestine into the hands of the UN. It's unlike any other place in the world as far as UN responsibility is concerned. And so, again, the criticism that, the, that Kerry makes, made and others that the UN devotes uh, prop uh, a disproportionate attention uh, to uh, the Israel-Palestine conflict is really the reverse of what it should be doing. And that is, it sh for uh, over 65 years, it's failed to realize the right of self-determination for the Palestinian people that every other major people in the world has enjoyed and achieved. And <laughs> And it, it's, we, it's, it's, we have reached a time when we should expect and demand of not only the US government, but of the international community, uh, that it fulfills this long uh, neglected responsibility uh, and not 
and not to uh, overlook the present realities of both peoples and the mistakes of the past, but to, to create some kind of future uh, that is viable for both peoples. My time is rapidly elapsing, more rapidly than my text, unfortunately. Uh, but let me just say the following, that Palestine may be winning the legitimacy war being waged throughout the world and at the United Nations to obtain popular support for the Palestinian cause with the peoples of the world. But it is continuing to lose the geopolitical war that is being waged within the organization. And it's very important to keep these two wars in mind. The, the, the legitimacy war is a war waged by people to achieve rights and justice. The geopolitical war is uh, being waged by powerful governmental forces linked to powerful economic forces that seek to, uh, to sustain unjust structures of authority and power. Let me stop there and thank you for your patience.